Israel is facing more international pressure to agree a ceasefire with Hamas. U.S. President Joe Biden has warned the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to consider the civilians living in the southern city of Rafah ahead of the planned military operation. Uh, joining me live from Israel is journalist Hannah McCarthy. Hannah, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Is uh, Netanyahu likely to listen to Joe Biden or certainly, if he hears him, do anything about it? I mean, what we've seen, you know, as, as a precedent, you know, over the last months and over the last years, indeed, is that, you know, simple statements are not going to necessarily sway Benjamin Netanyahu. There has to be a concrete, you know, policy action from the US if we're actually to see a change in how Israel conduct their military operation in Gaza. Um, you know, there's no sign that Netanyahu has, you know, taken on board the public criticism from Biden and the fact that Biden's administration has not actually changed their underlying policy of, you know, you know, providing billions of military aid to Israel does not suggest um, that they've taken a strong enough stance. And we saw some extremely punchy remarks from the top EU diplomat, uh, Joseph Borrell, yesterday, uh, who basically said, you know, if the US is going to you know, criticise uh, the levels of civilian casualties in Gaza, it's going to say stop killing so many people. Why doesn't it stop uh, giving so much military aid to Israel? Yeah. Um, he said, let's be logical. How many times have you heard the most prominent leaders and foreign ministers around the world saying too many people are being killed? Well, if you believe too many people are being killed then maybe you should provide less arms. And that's a, you know, a fairly direct uh, statement to Joe Biden. You, you know, words don't matter, actions do. And again, it's also interesting, he noted a Dutch court ruling uh, where the Netherlands had been uh, ordered to halt the shipment of components to Israel of F-35 fighter jets because of fears uh, that they would be violating the ICJ ruling uh, last month that uh, issued interim measures against Israel uh, to prevent a possible uh, genocide. So again, a very, very strong statement you know, from the EU's top diplomat uh, about you know, the risk of war crimes happening in, uh, in Rafa and, and the rest of Gaza indeed. Uh, and again, you know, possible international community complicity here. You know, I think, you know, we're at a point where I think leaders are genuinely wondering what will be, you know, the legacy if uh, Israel goes, you know, guns blazing into Rafah, a densely populated, you know, place with 1.5 million Palestinians mm. seeking safety. Now, uh, earlier this morning on this station, uh, an Israeli spokesman said um, that what they were doing was, you know, clearing the Gaza Strip a bit by bit and that although they were ordering people out of Rafa, that there were now safe places for them to go because they had eliminated Hamas in those areas. So the characterization that the people who were herded into Rafa by the Israelis now have nowhere to go, the Israelis are saying, hang on a second, we've sanitized other areas which are now safe to visit. Do you believe that? I mean, we already have reports today that, you know, there was, you know, fire exchange in central Gaza, uh, which, again, is north of Rafa. You know, we already have reports of exchanges in Khan Yunus. Uh, there are still active, you know, gun battles happening, you know, across the Gaza Strip, you know, in places where the Israeli forces have previously said they have, you know, quote unquote, sanitized or, you know, yeah, um, succeeded. So, and again, we already have reports, for example, in Gaza City um, of uh, Hamas uh, policemen, you know, coming out and being sent to, you know, man queues uh, for food and aid, you know, of Hamas coming out to pay, you know, civil servants. So, again, we're not seeing, you know, this idea that, you know, the Gaza Strip has complete, been completely uh, you know, sanitized of Hamas, what we're seeing is that they have again emerged. They have not been, you know, quote unquote, annihilated to use the Israeli uh, aim. Um, so, again, it's hard to see, you know, how they will suddenly um, succeed uh, in Rafa, where they have not succeeded elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. Mm. Now, the Israeli spokesperson maintained that there were 23 divisions of Hamas, uh, military divisions, if you like, and that they had eliminated 16 of them and uh, a couple more in, in Khan Yunus were about to be eliminated and that would leave four or five or whatever in Rafa and that's what they were uh, going to do. So he outlined very clearly what their military objectives are. Um at the same time, we saw when the rescue of two hostages took place a couple of days ago, that it resulted in the deaths of dozens of Palestinians, including women and children. Sure. So, look, obviously, the taking of civilian hostages is, is a war crime. 
uh, at the same time, I think when we look at the operation to free these hostages, uh, it seems that, you know, a tactic was, uh, to, you know, bomb a nearby building, causing, you know, dozens of deaths. Uh, in order to free these hostages. And I think there are real concerns about the calculation that the Israeli military are using surrounding uh, Palestinian civilian deaths in how they carry out military operations. Uh, and I think, you know, what we've seen is, you know, the level of civilian casualties, you know, versus, you know, the level of Hamas fighter deaths, you know, is way out of proportion. It is, you know, it, it just pales in comparison to any other, you know, major conflict we've seen in recent decades. You know, this is not what we would have seen in, you know, American operations in Iraq or British operations. You know, these would just not be acceptable civilian casualties for those militaries. Um, the, the Israeli spokesperson again uh, was comparing the what they were doing with uh, what happened in Mosul and said that the rate of attrition in Mosul, the killing of civilians to achieve far lesser ends, was much more proportionally uh, dramatic than what the Israels are doing. He was saying that what the Israelis are doing is, is a model for this uh, urban warfare for uh, armies going forward. Um, I mean, is this what the Israeli people are being told? And um, there is certainly, I mean, there the Israelis, I would say, like some of them are very familiar with, you know, uh, Israeli Hasbar, you know, military propaganda. And there would be, you know, some cynicism, some questioning around it. At the same time, there's certainly a lot of rhetoric, you know, among the Israeli public about annihilating uh, Hamas, you know, about the fact that they need to, you know, destroy the Gaza Strip and language that really, you know, is the result of, you know, years and even decades of, you know, dehumanizing Palestinians. What I would say as someone who's been to Mosul, you know, recently enough is that city is still destroyed and it is not comparable in terms of its geography as as uh, the Gaza Strip, which is, you know, a besieged tiny enclave. You know, Mosul, there was opportunities for people to flee elsewhere. And again, the actual uh, civilian casualties were not the same as what we've seen in the Gaza Strip, you know, in such a short, concentrated amount of time. Mosul, you know, took, you know, over a year uh, and again, it's not comparable. And the fact that they keep pointing to operations where many people would say there were flaws. And I would say, you know, again, Mosul, it still lies in ruins. There are still unexploded devices uh, in Mosul. It is still not uh, a place where, uh, you know, hospitals have been rebuilt. It is not a, any template that the international community should be looking to follow. Now, the, uh, the attempts by the Israelis to get some high ground uh, after they lost a lot of the the high ground with uh, the the initial attacks on Gaza City, the decimation of that city, uh, the images which were still being uh, made available because communications were working of um, you know children being killed and uh, mass burials and all of that. Um, so the Israelis having had, if you like, the moral high ground after the October 7th attacks, lost it with the ferocity of their attacks on Gaza City. They've attempted to win back some of the high ground by exposing the tunnel network operated by Hamas, claiming that uh, some of their operations were conducted under mosques, under hospitals, uh, under schools. And the network of tunnels, which, to be quite honest, is extensive and must have cost a fortune funded by somebody, um, the Israelis are saying this is how they operate, this is why we have to get to the heart of it. Um, it may be cutting some ice with their own population. Um, why is it not getting traction internationally? I mean, I think people you know, are aware that you know, Hamas has this extensive network that, again, is not you know, cheap to create. I mean, and I think, you know, at times, I think people, you know, maybe you know, take a black and white approach to this. You know, they're saying there's no way that there could be, you know, tunnels under hospitals and there's no way that Hamas could have, you know, used in any way health facilities. You know, I think there are signs that, you know, the, the situation is somewhere in between. Look, the Gaza Strip is a tiny place. The idea that, you know, some of the Hamas infrastructure will run under, you know, hospitals or schools, I don't think it should surprise people. But I think we have to remember that that still means there has to be a proportionate you know, approach. The mm. fact that, you know, one tunnel runs under a school or hospital should not mean that, you know, this building loses its entire uh, protected status and that everyone inside suddenly becomes a legitimate target. You know, that the response has to be proportionate. Uh, mm. And again, you know, again, the fact that, you know, hostages, you know, seem to have been held in some of the health facilities, and I don't think we should underplay that. Uh, we should recognise that does not necessarily mean that the appropriate response is to, you know, 
demolish a hospital. Uh, you know, we have to like understand, you know, the greys rather than just dealing in, you know, a black and white situation. Mm. Hamas likely have taken some of the aid. And I, I mean, speaking to some people on the ground, it seems like they have been able to direct where some of the aid convoys goes. The UN does not deliver humanitarian aid in situations where there is, you know, good rule of law, a reliable government uh, and, you know, safety. That's not, you know, where UN aid is delivered. It's delivered in complex, messy situations. And I think we all need to be, you know, alive to that. Yeah. Um, the, the question of UNRWA. Now, the head of UNRWA has said he's not going anywhere. He's not resigning, even though a number of people have been accused of uh, being complicit with uh, Hamas in the October 7th attacks, but also um, the, the some of the tunnels, the command and control tunnels and all of that um, connected literally uh, up above uh, to the uh, United Nations UNRWA headquarters. Uh, what do you make of those uh, things? Is this black propaganda by Israel or is just this a statement of the reality of the situation? Look, again, foreign journalists are not allowed in into Gaza Strip at the moment. You know, independent investigators are, are not allowed in at the moment. So it's, again, hard to assess. There likely could be, you know, tunnels underneath uh, some of these compounds, uh, which, you know, could be linked to the electricity grids. It's very hard, you know, to assess from afar, you know, whether this is indeed a central command or not. You know, is it, you know, ooh, this central command or not? Uh, it's hard to assess. But I think, again, even if it is the case, that is still not grounds to, unless there is clear evidence that, you know, for example, you know, someone in UNRWA, you know, green lighted this, you know, we need to see evidence before the mere existence of this command centre, you know, adjacent to an UNRWA uh, office is not enough to say that, you know, UNRWA should be dismantled. You know, there has to be, you know, evidence. And again, what we heard from Elon Levy, the Israeli spokesperson uh, last night on Channel 4, is that, you know, they had not provided further evidence from, you know, the, the dossier that had been re reviewed by several outlets, which did not provide concrete evidence, that they had not provided further concrete evidence, you know, to the UN investigation that is currently underway uh, in relation to those uh, allegations against UNRWA staff members mm. who may have been involved in the 7th of October. Yeah, uh I mean, they did uh, show some footage by various news outlets and they said, well, the Israelis wanted uh, to OK any uh, footage that they would release. But it's not really credible that the Israelis would uh, be able to go in and manufacture, you know, false facilities in um, the time they had. You know, th that's just not credible. So these are real, the Hamas operations beneath Gaza. These are real and very extensive. Oh, absolutely, and and again, I, 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 in no way was I discrediting the idea that you know Hamas does not have tunnels. But again, I think the key thing has to be proportionality. And again, there has to be if the, the fact that these tunnels are simply beside UN buildings does not mean they were green lighted by UNRWA, and that you know that is a specific claim. And there has to be evidence for that, and I don't think we've necessarily got the evidence that UNRWA you know, has given a green light to these tunnels. Clearly, Hamas has given a green light to these tunnels; otherwise, they wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, the, the texture on my screen here suggests said that Egypt should open the border. Why doesn't Egypt open the border if it is expressing concern about the humanitarian plight of the Palestinians, um, you know, fellow Arabs? Why would they not want to lend a hand? Uh, you know, obviously, this is extremely like complex issue, but uh, forcing, you know, people en masse to leave because of, you know, War is, you know, forced displacement, making you know conditions so bad that people are facing famine in Gaza Strip, uh, and you know for those reasons would move to Egypt. You know that's not voluntary migration; that's forced displacement. Uh, oh, I, again, I, I, no, I'm aware that it would be against international law; uh, it would be a, a war crime to do that. But you know, from a purely humanitarian point of view, well, I think we have to be careful about how we phrase this as humanitarian. Uh, and what we don't phrase as humanitarian. Uh, and again, you know, using humanitarian language to describe forced displacement, I think is a worrying trend. And we have to be really careful about this, you know, when we discuss this issue. Look, Egypt is extremely concerned about, you know, the mass displacement of, you know, up to, you know, two million Palestinians into its land. It has been clear that, you know, it signed a peace treaty and it is, you know, colluded with Israel, you know, regarding the siege of Gaza for almost two decades. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily this, you know, strong ally of Palestinians. Uh, otherwise, you know, it would not have conducted, you know, the siege, you know, in partnership with Israel over the last two decades. 
it, it's clear that, you know, that we've seen documents, you know, from, you know, the Israeli military about, you know, the possibility of displacing Palestinians uh, to Egypt, you know, from earlier in the war. It's not that suddenly, you know, the humanitarian situation is so bad that they've just thought of this idea. You know, there has already been, you know, a, a kind of documents and ideas about, you know, uh, the mass displacement of uh, Palestinians to Egypt, to Egypt, you know, for some time. Uh, it is, you know, language I, I've heard from, you know, settler groups and, you know, within Israel where they say, you know, why is there not voluntary migration? You know, the international community exists to help people in war. And I think it's a disingenuous argument to create a humanitarian crisis and to create those conditions of war in a small uh, landlocked besieged area where people cannot easily evacuate it to make them desperate enough to leave. Yeah, I'm just, you know, debating this idea that, you know, you have you talk about forced migration and so on, but you ask yourself if the Egyptians have any pity for the plight of people, irrespective of what international law says or doesn't say or what it might be a war crime or otherwise, you might think uh, that they would at least give a dig out to some of the children and so on who are in danger of their lives, quite frankly. I mean, there are, there are multiple crossings between the Gaza Strip and Israel. Why would they not allow, if, if the humanitarian situation is so severe and Israel you know, cares about it, why would they not allow Palestinians back into Israel? You know, Palestinians, they screen and who don't have associations with Hamas. And I think we just have to be careful about the extent to which, you know, the debate around, you know, uh, pushing Palestinians into Egypt has, you know, you know, focused around that rather than the recognition mm. that, you know, Israel has its own borders. It could open up. And the fact that that is just a farcical idea, anyone listening is going to know that no, there is no way that Israel would open up its own border crossings to allow, you know, mm. even under 12s or even, you know, women and children uh, into an area around the Gaza border. That's not going to happen. And the fact that, you know, the, the focus is on Egypt opening its border, I think is a remarkable testament of the Israeli uh the narrative that has been pushed by Israel and also the fact that we we just ex don't even think it's a plausible suggestion that they would open their crossings. All right, uh, Hannah, thank you very much for that. Hannah McCarthy, a freelance journalist speaking to us uh, from Israel.